Hi, welcome to the You Gotta Act channel. I'm Manuela Lazic, film critic, actress, and filmmaker. And this is Take Two, a series where we will look at some of the greatest performances in cinema to try and figure out what makes them so great. Anthony Minghella's 1999 film is based on the novel of the same name by Patricia Highsmith. For me, it tells one of the greatest stories about identity, deception, and social climbing, things that are all driving and troubling Tom Ripley, played by Matt Damon. When Tom is sent to meet the cool and wealthy Dickie Greenleaf, played by Jude Law, he first tries to be like him, and then to fully become him. I think this is Damon's greatest work yet. Let's see why. Thinking Tom went to Princeton with his son, Dickie's father has asked Tom to go to Italy and convince Dickie to finally return to New York. Questo è la mia faccia. Bird. In this scene, Tom establishes contact with Dickie, but in a very calculated way. This is my face. This is a great instance of what I'd call double acting for Matt Damon. Not only does he play a character, but his character himself is putting on an act. <laughs> I love how Minghella framed this. You see Tom in his ridiculous, flashy bathing suit, with his glasses still on, walking through the sea of tan Italian men, like a fish out of water. Damon keeps his body tense and his nose scrunched up, and he walks quickly. You can tell he's uncomfortable. This is Damon playing Ripley, a shy and introverted guy, but also a guy with a purpose. Damon here is only pretending to look at the sea. Acting is called acting because it's about physically doing things. So, if your character is looking at the sea, you can't be pretending to look at the sea. You have to actually do it. Damon's gaze doesn't have a clear direction here, and to anyone who's paying attention, he's not convincing. However, that's because his character, Tom, is faking it, and Tom himself knows that that's good enough for this moment. Minghella actually shows us that from where they're sitting, Dickie and Marge don't notice Tom. He seems like just another guy on the beach. If I make dinner at my place, right? A common tip for actors who want to look convincing while they deliver their lines is to have a physical action to do at the same time. Playing with a cigarette or putting your glasses in your shoes while you act distracts you from your own acting and makes it easier. Look at it then. Dickie Greenleaf? Who's that? Damon's intonation here is borderline unconvincing. Neither Dickie nor Marge seem to notice, but to us, the audience, it's clearly forced because we've seen him prepare his entrance. It's Tom, Tom Ripley. Tom Ripley? We were at Princeton together. Okay. The glasses are also part of Tom's act. By putting them back on when he introduces himself, he suggests that perhaps Dickie doesn't recognize him when he's not wearing them. Tom here has one clear goal to get Dickie and Marge to register him as a friendly acquaintance. So Damon turns on the boyish and clumsy charm he's always been known for. Did we know each other? Hello. Uh, well, I knew you, so I suppose you must have known me. Princeton's like a fog. America's like a fog. <laughs> this is Marge Sherwood. Tom, sorry, what is it? Ripley. How do you do? How do you do, Marge? What helps Damon here is Gwyneth Paltrow's work. She plays Marge as a kind-hearted person who's immediately generous towards Tom. What are you doing in Manji? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing much. It's passing through. <laughs> passing through? Yeah. <laughs> You're so white. <laughs> Do you ever see a guy so white, Marge? <laughs> Gray, actually. It's just an undercoat. <laughs> Say again? <laughs> you know, a primer. Damon can act off Paltrow's kindness, which helps him remain playful, even when Dickie criticizes him. That's fun. Margie likes that, 
because she's so white. Yes, I do, and you're not funny. Will you should come and have lunch with us before you go? Yes, Tiki? Sure, anytime. Well, coincidence. Again, this line could seem overacted in another context, but since Damon has been playing Tom as a slightly awkward guy, it actually makes Tom even more convincing. That's so funny. This is the big twist. However, how that twist comes to be is quite complex. We're about an hour into the film, and Tom has managed to build a strong friendship with Dickie. They're having a last outing together before Tom is to return to America, and he explains to Dickie that he plans to return to Italy to essentially continue living the way they have, which is together. Beautiful. I wanted to tell you my plan. God. So Out. tell me. Well, I thought I'd come back in the new year under my own steam. Really? To Italy? Of course. And I figured, now, just for argument's sake, say I got a place, or say we split the rent on a house, and I could get a job, or better still, if I got a place in Rome, and then when we're there, we could be there, and then when we're here, we could be here. Damon also sounds like a kid talking about the great plans he's got for the holidays. He adds a touch of naivete that is completely in line with how Tom has been depicted so far. He's a wild-eyed kid who loves rich and flamboyant people like Dickie. God, I don't think so. See, particularly with the Marge problem, you just blame me. At this point, Tom thinks he doesn't have to gain Dickie's trust anymore, so Damon acts much more confident than before. He drops the phrase, the Marge problem, casually and with a smile, like they're just guys being dudes chatting about the girls they play with. Marge and I are getting married. How? How? Yesterday you were ogling girls on the terrace. If today you're getting married? That's absurd. I love Marge. You love me. You're not marrying me. Tom, I don't love you. No, I, I don't mean that as a threat. To be honest, I'm, I'm a little relieved you're going. Because he's convinced that he truly is like a brother to Dickie, Tom allows himself to openly criticize him for the first time. And since Tom is simply being frank, Damon doesn't act aggressive, but simply surprised. He keeps his hands to his sides and leans towards Jude Law, while Law looks away. Because Tom wants to engage with Dickie, while Dickie wants him to shut up. I think we've seen enough of each other for a while. What? You can be a leech! You know that! And... Boring. You can be quite boring. There's a dramatic shift in Tom here. Damon looks away as if to escape the situation because Tom's feelings are hurt. He realizes that Dickie doesn't want to be around him at all. It's a dramatic pose that the score emphasizes, and seeing Damon's profile announces that we are about to see a different side of him. The funny thing is I'm not pretending to be somebody else, and you are. Boring. I've been absolutely honest with you about my feelings. Boring. I think Tom believes he's being truthful because admitting he's a liar would crush him. He's bought into his own lies because they make him feel like a better person than the one he really is. The talented Mr. Ripley is considered to be one of the best film depictions of narcissism personality disorder. Like he says later, Tom feels like he's a nobody, so he has to pretend to be somebody he's not. He wants desperately to rise above his rank and be admired by other people, so he lies constantly. So when Damon says he's not pretending to be somebody else, he means it, and we believe it, even though we know it isn't true. But you, first of all, I know there's something. That evening, when we played chess, for instance, it was obvious. What evening? Oh, sure, no, no, it's too dangerous for you to take on. Oh, no, no, well, we're brothers. Hey. And then you do this sordid thing with Marge, fucking her on the boat while we all have to listen, which was excruciating. And you follow your cock around like a, and now you're getting married. No, I'm bewildered, forgive me. You're, you're lying to Marge and then you're getting married to her. You're knocking up Silvana. 
Damon really translates the complicated feelings that Tom is having here. Damon acts outraged by staring at Lo and shouting at him, and his tone is accusatory, like a schoolteacher's. We kind of agree with Dicky that Tom is being a bit boring here. You're ruining everybody. You, you want to play the sax, you want to play the drums. Which is it, Dicky? What do you actually play? <laughs> Society and our parents have taught us different things depending on our temperament. Some people have learned to never get angry and only ever express their anger through tears or by completely shutting down. Other people get mad when what they really want to do is cry, perhaps because they've been told they cry too much. Here Damon is choosing anger, he's speaking fast and raising his voice, but at the same time his eyes are getting misty and he's stumbling over his words. It's as if he were torn between anger and sadness, but mostly what's driving Damon here is a feeling of rejection. Often when we're angry, what lies underneath that anger is a feeling of sadness and vice versa. It's one of the first things I learned in acting class. Who are you? Huh? Some third class mooch? Who are you? Who are you to say anything to me? Who are you to tell me anything? Actually, I really, really do not want to be on this boat with you. Again, Tom is torn between his feelings for Dickie and his feelings for himself, his narcissism. Damon is scared and crawls away when Dickie slaps him around because he's totally humiliated and overpowered physically. However, when Dickie turns away and gives him room, what he said about Tom's social status sinks in, and Damon starts boiling with rage. Chef gives me the creeps. You give me the creeps. Damon and Law work really well together here to push each other's buttons. Law plays Dicky like an incredibly rude and selfish guy, which helps Damon feel terrible and like he needs to defend himself. Shut, Shut up! Dicky, 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 like a little girl all the time. Shut up! What's great here is that the chain of events is horrible, but also perfectly coherent thanks to Damon. Because he perfectly expresses how Tom feels both heartbroken and offended, he makes his extreme gesture make sense. It's like an accident that's both shocking and logical. This is the final pivotal scene, where Tom realizes that he's still trapped in the mess he's made. He successfully made Dickie pass for Freddy's murderer and convinced Dickie's father to stop searching for him. So now he's traveling by boat with Peter Smith Kingsley, played by Jack Davenport, who's become his lover. But there's one person he's forgotten to deal with. Dickie! Meredith was the first person with whom Tom pretended to actually be Dickie. He also had the beginning of a romance with her. And now she's back, surprised to see him there, while everyone believes he's a murderer on the run. Damon again has a tough part to play. He's Tom in crisis, having to pretend to be Dicky and to think on his feet about what to do. Oh my God. Damon looks up to Kate Blanchett with a fixed Hello, smile. Meredith. It's discreet, but he's shuffling on his feet like an animal looking for I an exit. I was looking at you. You're close. I wouldn't have known you. Well, you spotted me, so you get the reward. What? Just kidding. Are you alone? Oh. Hardly. Couldn't be less alone. When Tom realizes that Meredith's whole entourage has also seen him, he knows that he can't just kill her, and so he adapts to the situation like he's always done. Damon's goal here is to figure out what to do while not making Meredith suspicious and get away from the situation ASAP. Aunt Joan. And Co. <sighs> a lot of Co. He plays Tom trying to act cool by having a full smile on his face and waving at Meredith's friends rather than avoid them. But we can see their discomfort in all his movements. When Meredith starts talking about her feelings, Damon gets agitated and Tom can't help but turn around to look at the people on the upper deck. His smile is almost distorted and his movements are quick and stiff. I thought about you so much. I've thought about you. Yeah, well, when I thought about you, I was mostly hating you. Tom is smart. He knows that Meredith just wants to like him. So Damon gets cute again, because his goal is to get Blanchett to be charmed by him. He looks at her kindly when she claims to have been hating him, to make it impossible for her to stay mad. Where have you been hiding? He comes up with a perfect explanation and delivers it convincingly, because, again, Damon and Tom have a clear goal. I haven't been hiding. I've been in police custody. They've been trying to flush out Freddy's killer. You're kidding. 
As he expected, Meredith takes the bait because she already wanted to believe in him even before he spoke. Well, that's they're giving me this vacation, which is why the get up, which is why you haven't heard from me. You know, the whole world thinks you killed Freddy. <sighs> Oh, it's terrible. I know. He wants Meredith to see Tom as an innocent victim of circumstances, so he acts all amazed and amused by what has happened to him. He also drops a hint that he had wanted to see her, to make Meredith believe that he truly does like her. Listen, I can't talk now. Um, later? Tom wants to get out of here, but Meredith wants more proof of his later. affection for her. Blanchard stares at Damon like a sad puppy when he says he has to go. So Damon gets even more charming and leans in for a romantic kiss on the deck. It is a great movie kiss, even if it's not sincere, because Damon's double acting is on point. He plays Tom as confident here, because he knows exactly that all he has to do is give Meredith what she wants. Are you and so he does. Traveling under armor. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> I am. <laughs> <laughs> Meredith problem solved. Dickie, are you with Peter Smith Kingsley? I, I bet you are. My aunt thought she saw him. Peter Smith Kingsley? No. I haven't seen him in months. Meredith knows Peter, and the chances that they wouldn't meet at some point and talk about Tom slash fake Dicky are slim. So when Meredith mentions him, Tom knows he's in trouble. Again, he can come up with an answer, but his feelings show up. No, I'm alone. Damon takes a short pause before his reply and looks away at the sea, because Meredith has reminded him of the one person he really loves and who he will have to kill. Even for a great pretender like Tom, it's hard to play it straight when your heart is breaking. He doesn't want Meredith to notice the sadness and disgust in his eyes when he says he's alone. A statement that, for once, is the truth. These were my thoughts on the talented Mr. Ripley, a film I could rewatch endlessly because it's so rich and its characters are so fascinating. I've got the like it! Oh, yes! Let us know what you thought in the comments. Don't forget to leave a like and subscribe. And tell us if there's a film in particular that you'd like me to cover on here. In case you don't know, you can also find on this channel the You Gotta Act podcast slash show where I talk to people in film about actors they love. And you can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash you gotta act. That's it for now. See you next time.